in education to the poor equality, this meeting is being recorded equality of opportunity and empowering people through education and skill development inequalities are at the highest level presently and are widening and further rising due to the covid-19 crisis currently the top 10% of income earners take home over 10 times more pay than the bottom 10% growth following the business as usual approaches rarely work for all sections and is putting everyone's well-being at risk there is a need to develop improved models that focus on ensuring growth but are of a type that actually improve the lives of all the sections of people some social groups and regions across nations have been left out for decades and require additional support with the right policies and investments in essential public services the divides can be bridged for ensuring future security and prosperity globalization has induced radical shifts that need to be anticipated requiring appropriate actions such as building the skills of tomorrow's workforce supporting entrepreneurship while also safeguarding job quality the growing number of migrants also pose peculiar challenges for the attainment of social cohesion inclusive growth also implies supportive policies towards micro small and medium enterprises for a more broad based growth across the sectors technological breakthroughs and widespread adoption of technologies for enhancing productivity besides the creation of infrastructure and other investments for developing countries inclusive growth can become a reality by acquiring competitiveness in new and emerging sectors additionally policies to support inclusive growth have to address significant market failures which are visible across the countries for a more sustainable path to growth better government policies fair and accountable public institutions unbiased regulatory mechanism uh, environment and sustainable business practices are essential part of the such a uh, uh, inclusive growth process so today is a fitting and opportune time to discuss issues and challenges confronting inclusive and balanced growth and we are indeed fortunate to have amidst us a renowned practitioner and economist to speak on the larger theme of policies for economic growth and inclusion i on behalf of the governing body and my colleagues at spicer i'm privileged to extend a warm welcome to professor mahindra dev he kindly and promptly consented to our request to deliver the dt lakhawala memorial lecture that spicer regularly organizes to felicitate the memory of a founding father and eminent economist professor lakhawala As you all know Professor Lakhawala had a long and distinguished academic career. Amongst other achievements he was president of the Economic As uh, Indian Economic Association the Indian Society of Labor Economics Gujarat Economic Association he was recipient of numerous awards including the Dada Bhai Naroji award twice for his distinguished work in economics Professor Lakhawala served as chairman and member of a large number of commission committees and commissions appointed by the government from time to time he was deputy chairman of the planning commission and took active interest in the establishment of sardar patel institute as his founder director in the later years of his life he was emeritus professor here and remained associated with our institute till he breathed his last in 1992 at this juncture i would also briefly like to introduce our guest speaker professor s mahendra dev director and vice chancellor indira gandhi institute of development research mumbai Prior to this position he was chairman of the commission for agricultural cost and prices vice chairman of ifri member and chairman of the national statistical commission he was awarded the prestigious malcolm adishaya award in 2016 the delhi school of economics felicitated him for the distinguished alumni award for his outstanding ach academic achievements he was director for the center for economic and social studies at hyderabad for several years He has been president of the Indian Society of Agricultural Marketing, Indian Economic Association, Indian Agricultural Marketing Association, and also presided over the annual conferences of IISA, IL, ISLE, amongst other such notable uh, bodies. He received his PhD from Delhi School of Economics and did his postdoctoral research at Yale University. Dr. Dev's current and main areas of interest are agriculture, rural economy. rural non farm sector cooperation global economy employment and unemployment policies social protection development economies and social sectors he has numerous research publications in all these areas and has written several papers and books which are edited and authored by him 
His well-cited publication is Inclusive Growth in India, Agriculture, Poverty, and Human Development. His book, Perspectives on Equitable Development, was released by the former Prime Minister of India. Professor Mahindra Dev has been consultant or advisor to several international organizations. He is member of several government committees in India, including the Prime Minister's Task Force on Employment, the Enterprises and National Commission for Enterprises in an Organized Sector, Committee on Financial Inclusion, uh, Expert Group on Poverty, and uh, several other such uh, committees. Earlier, as in the Planning Commission, he is also currently member of several committees of NTIO. Sir, it is with immense joy that we welcome you to be the key speaker at today's event. I would also like to invite Professor Vaikyalag, distinguished economist, eminent scholar of policy planning, economic growth, agricultural labor and development economics, former member of parliament and union minister to chair the session. Prof Professor Alag's accomplishments are too numerous and his contributions to the extant literature too diverse to be able to do justice mentioning here. Fortunately for Spicer, Professor Alag, like his predecessor, Professor Lakhrawala, was director of the institute. He is currently Professor Emeritus and Vice Chairman of the Governing Board. We are indeed grateful, sir, to have you with us today. I would now humbly request Professor Alag to take over the proceedings by introducing Professor Lagrawala and the large theme of today's lecture. After the completion of Professor Dave's lecture and subject to the availability of time, I would request Professor Dave to take up one or two questions from the audiences. Uh, I would now request Professor Alag to take over the proceedings and uh, give his comments. And I would also request that audiences would please remain mute during the duration of the lecture. Professor Alag. Professor Mahindra Dev, uh, the director of Meta, it would be the proud privilege to uh, introduce Professor Gigi Lakawala. And for very Lakawala, young Phil D. Lakawala, was a distinguished economist of the West Indies in India. Having done his PhD with the late Professor S.P. Uh, he then went on to uh, become the director of the uh, Bombay School of Economics. And in that capacity, in 68, he took a year off to come to Ahmedabad. After the creation of the Bombay State, the Gopal Institute, as well as the School of Economics, had gone to Maharashtra. So the objective was to set up the high level research institute. In, in Ahmedabad. When came to Ahmedabad, he had already uh, appointed me as a deputy director with uh, the senior professorship. Uh, and I had joined. He brought along with him to the Sundarmanian, who was a student. We also uh, brought uh, a very distinguished economist like uh, Dr. Lekasi Kasyap, V. N. Mishra, T. Uh, S. Papola, and from America, the Guru Modi had returned. We brought them as one place. And that is the beginning of the Siddhartha Kali Institute. He laid the foundation stone of the building from which we are doing this as a, a virtual meeting, but we hope to uh, invite you to the campus the next time you come. I uh, must apologize to you, to all of you, to everybody saying that uh, the audio is bad. I hope the organizers will take care of that particular meeting. At this stage, I am happy to introduce the late Ventuk S. C. Lakawala and to uh, look forward to the lecture 
the new government by uh, Dr. Mahim Jade. I must say that this lecture is very appropriate. Just a week ago, the IMA now representative there, he announced that the poorest of the poor have improved their standard of living, and that is shown by the terms of trade movement in uh, the World Bank. I am a free. Now I think the first thing to recognize is that the terms of trade in trade of a license do very different uh, proportions as compared to the consumption of the fuel. And uh, it is almost an accident that the dollar won for day was accepted. In fact, I had at that stage protested, but they said, you mean that it corresponds to the Indian poverty line, what is called the official poverty line, and sometimes the other poverty line. Now, changes in that did not take place in spite of my research. Suresh uh, Tendulkar made matters worse by making the uh, uh, rural, uh, rural poverty line also the urban poverty line. And the only scholars who did that that was systematically was Rangarajan and S. Mahindra Day, and their volume is still a classic of the subject, which I'm sure Professor Mahindra Day will talk about. Meanwhile, uh, the planning commission was abolished, and the government does not go by those pieces. But I'm sure that Professor Mahindra Day's lecture today and the volume that he has. Perennial interest by scholars both in academia as well as by students. I'm so happy that we have agreed to be this lecture. I welcome it and I look forward to hearing from you. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you so much, Professor Alag. And we always uh, appreciate your uh, knowledgeable discourse on the poverty debate that the country has uh, faced in the past and continues to do so. So really grateful that you could, uh, despite your ill health, you could be with us and uh, request, uh, concede to our request to chair this session. I would now request uh, Professor Mahindra Dev to uh, initiate and go ahead with his, uh, the DT Lakavala memory lecture now. Thank you. Uh, Professor YK Alag. Professor uh, Niti Mehta, Professor Hansa Jain, and friends. So it's a great honor and privilege to deliver Professor D.T. Lagdawala Memorial Lecture. So I'm grateful to Professor Alag, uh, Dr. Mehta, and the Sardar Patel Institute of Economic and Social Research for conferring this honor to me. I'm happy that uh, Professor Alag is chairing this lecture. So I have great respect to, for Professor Alag uh, for his contributions to the country in various capacities. Turning to Professor Lagdawala, his contributions to research, policy, and institutional building are well known. On institutions, of course, he contributed a lot to the development of uh, Bombay School of Economics and uh, Sardar Patel Institute, as uh, Professor Alag mentioned. Uh, I met him a few times in Mumbai, Ahmedabad, and uh, Delhi. I have benefited from the Lagdawala Committee report on poverty. Uh, because when I was with the Rangarajan Committee on Poverty, I referred uh, you know, a few times this, uh, this important report. Uh, in fact, it was the first report to de-link uh, you know, national account statistics data and concentrate on NSS data for estimating poverty. Dr. Lagdawala was a member of IGADR board uh, from its inception uh, till April 1992. So he encouraged me a lot during that time. So keep, keeping in mind, uh, you know, Professor Lagdawala's broader interests, I have chosen to speak on policies for growth and inclusion. In fact, I've been giving lectures on growth, inclusion, and sustainability in the last one year. So I thought I would share this uh, with all of you. In fact, it is an overview of a kind of presentation on issues and uh, policies relating to growth and inclusion. So I prepared a, a long PowerPoint presentation 
So the slides are self-explanatory. So I'll be a bit faster in presentation. So I'll uh, share the screen. So the contents of the lecture are the economic growth, uh, the recent trends, and also policies. The, uh, I, I'm not uh, covering entire policies, but focus on infrastructure, exports, and financial sector. And on inclusion, the, the structural change and employment. Uh, and also uh, here, I talk uh, more of agriculture and food systems approach. It's a new approach, it's coming. And manufacturing and services. And then I come to the poverty and inequality, the measurement and trends, and some policy issues on social sector, employment, social protection, sustainability. And lastly, on few uh, words on monetary and fiscal policies, the macro policies. It's not going down. I'll again come back. Yeah, there is some problem. The arrows are not going down. Now I start with uh, uh, growth in uh, pre-COVID uh, Indian economy. Uh, you know, as you know, growth and inclusive growth are complementary to each other, but there can be trade-offs. Uh, Indian economy, you know, is slowing down even before COVID. Uh, there were other shocks like uh, demonetization, GST, and there was also uh, demonetization. Uh, you know, the twin balance sheet problem, like high NPA high liberal corporate sector, and GDP growth slowed from 8% to uh, no, 3% over 2017-18. Uh, uh, in fact, annual GDP growth also showed uh, slowdown to 3.7% in 2019-20. In fact, Arvind Subramanian uh, said, as compared to 2003-10, all the indicators showed great deceleration during 2013 and 18. Uh, in fact, you can see the decline from 2017-18 quarterly, uh, first quarter to last quarter of 3.1. Uh, then the annual also, it shows a decline, uh, particularly from 2016-17 to 2019-20. Uh, this is the Arvind Subramanian showed that 2003-10 and 2013-18, if you see, uh, you know, the IIP investment, imports, credit, exports, tax revenues, IAP consumption. So everything there will decline during 2013-18 compared to 2003-10. Uh, then uh, if you see the pandemic impact, uh, you can see that it has gone down to minus 6.6 .6 and then to uh, 8.91 expects. Uh, impact of COVID, uh, as I said, you know, it declined minus 6.6 .6 and 8.9. And FY23, it is expected to be around 7%. However, if you look at the levels, uh, you know, FY22 levels are more or less similar with slight increase as compared to FY20. That, so two years, we had only growth of 0.9% per year. Uh, you know, it's, the GDP is 1.8% FY22. And private consumption was higher by 1.2% and investment by 2.6%. Only thing uh, higher was exports and imports. Recently, it has increased 10%, 12%. On the supply side, you see the sectors, uh, the contact intensive sector still, they are much lower. Trade, hotels, transport was uh, still lower than the pre-COVID level. Uh, recently, report on currency and finance, RBI, uh, you know, says the following. The 
pre-COVID trend growth was uh, 6.6 uh, and uh, percent per two, uh, 2012 to 13. And during 13, 14, it was 7.1 percent. So take, taking the actual growth, minus 6.6, 8.9, and 7.2, uh, and 7.5 percent beyond, India is expected to overcome the pandemic losses in 2034, 35. That is about 10 years it takes uh, you know, to overcome the losses. That is the RBI report on currency and finance says. Uh, in fact, they estimated the losses for individual years, you know, 19 lakh crores, 17 lakh crores, 16 lakh crores during these last two years and this year. Of course, presently, inflation is a serious problem, nearly 7%. It can also affect growth. Uh, now I come to the policies and drivers of growth. One is the global challenge. Uh, you know, India is more integrated with the world than before. Uh, there are many global challenges, geopolitical challenges uh, like, uh, you know, USA and China, uh, bipolar world. Uh, but of course, now Russia has come back. Uh, and other problems like climate change, migration, automation due to technologies, protectionism, and inequalities are rising, as uh, Dr. Mehta and, uh, uh, has mentioned. The present uh, uh, Russia-Ukraine war also has impact on global economic growth and, of course, on India's growth. So these global challenges, uh, you know, India, India can't avoid. So it will have uh, impact on our economic and social uh, development. Uh, if you see global projections of IMF, uh, April 2022, uh, in fact, uh, they have reduced the global growth about 4% to 3.6%, 2022-2023. And India they have, is a, one of the uh, high growth sectors, uh, high growth uh, countries, uh, 8.2, 22, and uh, 23, about 6.9. More importantly, growth is uh, uh, only 4.4. I mean, first time China, uh, you can see less than uh, you know 10% or 8%. So that may affect also global uh, growth. Uh, you can see USA, Germany, all uh, low growth expected 22, 23. Uh, and only ASEAN countries, 5.3% uh, growth is expected. And the coming to domestic drivers, uh, infrastructure, of course, is the most crucial one. A lot of progress has happened, but if you compare our indicators with uh, many of the Southeast Asian countries and China, of course, the still we are very uh, in a poor indicators, urban and rural infrastructure. And also worry is that investment rate is declining in recent years, declined from 39% to in 2011, 12 to 30.7% in pre-pandemic year. And even gross fixed capital also, there is a decline uh, significantly. So both public and private investment has to be improved in the next uh, few years. You can see the, uh, you know, almost 39% in 2011-22 uh, investment rate declined to almost 31%. Uh, in 2920, of course, uh, the 2021 is the pandemic year. Uh, gross fixed capital formation also there is a decline. So you can see this uh, decline uh, over time, investment rate and government fixed capital formation. So infrastructure is uh, important for future of India. Uh, you know, for example, during Atal Bihari Vajpayee government, uh, they started Golden Quadrilateral Highway Road project. In fact, one study showed that. Uh, the impact of this project on the manufacturing activity uh, is quite good. Uh, for instance, uh, even in some districts, density districts like Surat in Gujarat or Srikakulam in Andhra Pradesh, registered a you know, more than 100% increase in new output and new establishment due to this golden co uh, quadrilateral uh, highway pro road project. So the infrastructure has significant impact. So government, uh, you know, last uh, two budgets, uh, you know, they have outlined infrastructure project pipeline, uh, what more than uh, 111 lakh crores, and last two budgets also focused. Of course, all these plans depend on how infrastructure uh, depends on the effective implementation in the next few years. Now, I come to the trade policy. Uh, it is well known that exports are one of the main engines of growth. And uh, in fact, when India had high growth during 2000 to 2011, Exports grew at 21% and 24%. However, uh, during 2012-19, uh, 
uh, in fact, the annual growth of exports is almost 0%. Uh, more recently, of course, pandemic has impacted. Similarly, Russia, Ukraine war may have some impact on trade. Uh, in fact, IGID has done a study. There are, uh, you know, it says that there are two groups of industries that hold the greatest potential for export growth and also employment generation. Uh, there is a huge uh, unexploited potential, potential, for example, uh, you know, textiles, clothing, footwear, uh, so they're labor intensive products. And second is the global value chains, uh, where uh, India can emerge as a major hub. Now that China, you know, withdrawing in some of the areas, so there is opportunity. I mean, the government announced this PLI scheme, but performance linked incentive scheme for 10 sectors. But uh, some of them, if you look at, they're more cap capital intensive. But one problem is that in recent years, India's trade policy has become more protectionist. Uh, tariff rates have increased and need to reduce tariffs so that India can uh, make advantage of the space vacated by China. Uh, the, uh, again, this RBI report, uh, you know, recently uh, trade policy, it said there is a revealed comparative advantage for <clears throat> 91 sectors. Uh, it also says that free trade agreements have not uh, been trade creating the past ones. Uh, and also it says that technology and uh, imports are important uh, for exports. And similarly, exchange rate stability also helps uh, exports. And also now the green export opportunities for exports are there <clears throat> because many uh, countries are moving to green exports uh, and also greater imports for, you know, uh, at lower tariff. So the tariff rates <clears throat> have to be reduced uh, and FDI also can boost exports and enhance capacity. <clears throat> now after uh, investment and trade, uh, the financial sector uh, is important because that can uh, lead to higher, higher growth, the performance. Uh, the twin balance sheet problem this time is much better. The corporate sector has done well, uh, particularly during the COVID time. NPS declined, uh, but defaults for NBFCs, non-banking financial companies and microfinance is still uh, there. And also there is a disconnect between stock market and real sector. Uh, this is mainly because of plenty of global and domestic liquidity. And banks are also becoming risk averse. Uh, credit growth is low, but there was some increase, of course, in uh, if you see the recent uh, data. Uh, credit to GDP ratio in India is only 50%, while in other countries it is 100 to 150%. So there is a need for rise in credit in India is obvious. Uh, I mean, globally, some stability has been done because of the you know monetary policy and all. Uh, so in the Indian context also, health of banking is important, uh, you know, building a capital base, good corporate governance. Some people say, you know, the privatization of banks uh, is the answer, but it may not be the answer because if you see corporate governance, when we had problems uh, in private banks, like we have seen S-Bank or ICIC Bank earlier. Uh, Again, this report on uh, the currency and finance shows that uh, you no know, credit revival uh, depends on how effectively and quickly financial sector is distressed. So banks need to uh, direct credit to credit to productive sectors, and also IBC, the insolvency and bankruptcy need to be harnessed more uh, efficiently. Uh, there is a need for financial inclusion and uh, reduce inequalities with the financial sector. And, uh, and again, green finance uh, is coming. Uh, it, it's becoming an important one uh, to achieve the goal of net zero by 2070. Now, after the growth, I will come to the inclusion, the trends and policies. Here I talked about uh, you know, structural transformation and agriculture and food, sec uh, food uh, system sum uh, summit, et, et cetera, and industry and services, employment, poverty, inequality, uh, social sector, etc. I'll uh, talk about that. Uh, you, we know the sectoral issues, uh, the employment and growth, uh, in the GDP growth are disconnected uh, because uh, there has been structural change from agriculture to services and GDP, but still employment is still largest employer agriculture. Uh, the, we all know that manufacturing uh, is the engine of structural transformation, but 
the employment has not increased uh, for manufacturing. Uh, there are two sources of productivity. One is productivity within sectors. Second one is shifting workers from low productivity to high productivity sectors. So the, where the structural transformation needed. needed. Now I spent some time on agriculture. Uh, you know, agriculture has significant progress in uh, last since independence. Uh, we have uh, come from food deficit country to food self-sufficiency. Uh, we had several revolutions, the white, green, uh, in cotton, and also good progress in horticulture. Uh, India is largest producer in milk and uh, other uh, commodities, and second largest in wheat, rice, etc. However, green revolution approach uh, has led to lots of problems, the soil erosion, water logging, groundwater depletion uh, led, led to unsustainability. Uh, so I was talking about this food systems because now people are talking about uh, the value chains and this kind of thing. So in September 21, uh, 2021, the UN Secretary General has convened food system summit. So basically transformation of global food systems in order to achieve SDGs by 2030. There are five action tracks to achieve the objectives uh, under these food systems. One is safe and nutritious food for all. Second, uh, sustainable consumption patterns. Third, uh, basically environment one, uh, nature positive production. Fourth, equitable livelihoods. And fifth, uh, resilience to shocks and uh, stress. So these are the things they are going to work in the next few years on food systems summit which they think we can achieve some of the SDGs, particularly under agriculture and uh, you know, equity. So the narrative of Indian agriculture has to be changed, more diversified high value production. It must be inclusive in terms of women and small farmers and also uh, unsustainable. Uh, but government policies, price and water policies tend to focus on rice and wheat. In fact, three crops, rice, wheat, sugar cane, corners 75 to 80 percent of irrigated water in the country. So there is no need to promote uh, you know, other crops, horticulture, millets, uh, for uh, oil seeds, for more equal, equitable distribution. Uh, now we come to the incomes of the farmers. You know, the situation assessment surveys show that in current prices, uh, you know, farmers income increased from 2000 rupees in 2003 to 10,000 rupees in 2018-19. This is in current prices. Uh, the share of cultivation uh, increased initially, but the share declined recently. In fact, it declined to 37%. Uh, the share of income from animals uh, increased. Uh, the share of wage income also increased. It is the highest actually. In other words, more farmers are becoming uh, wage laborers uh, for you know to get more income. For example, uh, you know, this is the income and current prices. But if you see the share, share from cultivation has declined uh, about 48% in 2013. It declined to 2018-19. Animals, it has increased. And wages uh, also increased to 40%. Uh, so uh, there is a significant structural uh, change here. But if you adjust for inflation, the farmer's income increased only from 6,400 to 7,800. So there was only 21% increase in farmer's income over six year period. That is about 3.5% per annum. So we need more than 10% per annum to double the incomes of the farmers. In fact, uh, in 2018-19, uh, you know, farmers are getting only 127 per day from cultivation uh, rupees and 341 rupees from all sources. So this is very serious situation for agriculture households, the incomes of the farmers. Uh, and the policies for smallholders, we all know that, uh, you know, they need support uh, I mean, in uh, institutional and technological uh, other things. So, and India has, of course, best institutional practices in agriculture marketing. Smallholders have to organize, uh, you know, farmer producing organizations, some are doing well, but some are on paper. So there is a need to increase their efficiency. And each of all of ITC is an example of technology and marketing reforms also should help smallholders. 
So Amul model in dairy sector is one of the things for value chains people side. You all know, I don't have to tell this uh, Amul success uh, created by the father of white revolution, uh, Dr. Kurian. Uh, but both smallholders and you know, women and consumers benefit from this model. And Amul success also, we know strong brand, efficient supply chain, uh, diverse portfolio, uh, innovation, etc. Now there is a lot of, lot of literature on safe and healthy diets for sustainable food systems. For example, Eat Lancet Commission recommends a healthy and sustainable diet, which is the, you know, not affordable for majority of population in India. So a study by Tata Karnal Institute shows that if you follow the Eat Lancet Commission recommendation, India, you need $3 uh, for rural and $5 per person day. Uh, range from $3 to $5. But actual dietary intake at present is only $1 per person day. So unless you increase the incomes of the population, you can't have sustainable, I mean, uh, healthy diets. I mean, sometimes even availability is a problem. For example, in rural areas, the uh, chips packets and biscuits are easily available compared to other healthy foods. In fact, many healthy foods are unaffordable for low income consumers. Uh, if you see Nigeria, one egg costs about, uh, for the fourth in income quintile, about 44% of their daily income. And India, about 16% of their daily income. So they are, these are unaffordable for low-income uh, consumers. Uh, fruits and, and vegetables and animal source foods are expensive to buy for a common uh, woman or man. Uh, the animal source foods are still needed because in advanced countries, there is a movement that they want to stop the animal source foods over time. But in India, per capita consumption is still below, <clears throat> below 10 kilograms uh, as compared to 60 to 70 kilograms in advanced countries. So there is still scope for animal source foods. And sustainability of food and agriculture, uh, this is crucial for the, because the food sector emits 30% of the world's greenhouse gases. So adverse climate change falls on smallholders and informal workers. Sustainability achieved in value chains, consumption and production. So food systems approach uh, covers from production to consumption. So that can help uh, uh, more inclusive policies. So climate resilient cropping patterns uh, in the post harvest losses are high in India. This has to be reduced with uh, efficient value chains and also policies for women <clears throat> because uh, inclusive policies uh, should uh, cover women and small farmers. Uh, they are, uh, you know, particularly the levels of their income, uh, both farmers and agricultural laborers is crucial for uh, income and nutrition. Uh, there are examples, women's cooperatives like Kutumbusri program, Kerala, they can be used to encourage production and consumption of nutrient uh, rich foods. Uh, finally, on agriculture, uh, the role of non-agriculture. Some economists like uh, late Professor T. N. Srinivasan argued that solution for problems in agri agriculture lies in non-agriculture. Uh, that's why labor intensive manufacturing services is one of the solutions for agriculture development. However, agriculture transformation also important because of uh, inclusive and sustainable uh, policies. Uh, industry, you know, we see manufacturing, construction are the main subsectors. Uh, in fact, construction absorbed labor uh, during 2004-05 to 2011-12, but there has been any hardly any change in the you know employment and output of manufacturing. So, labor-intensive manufacturing is of course a must, but we can't follow Chinese model of transformation. Although there is still a lot of scope for, you know, for example, MSME sector, uh, you, you, there is a lot of uh, scope. Uh, there are services, there are a lot of opportunities for India. For example, uh, you know, can you think of top 10 global service brands? Uh, there are the, these are the names come to our minds. Facebook, Google, uh, Airbnb, Amazon, LinkedIn, etc. Or even food and beverages like Starbucks. So what is common about all of them? Most of the names comes from USA. But what is that Americans are focusing on which, you know, Europeans, uh, Asians, Japanese, Indians do not focus. Was, I mean, main thing is customer centricity. 
uh, you know, services is important. For example, uh, you know, all of these, uh, there is a lot of emphasis on customer centricity. So India also can think of more innovations in uh, service sector uh, to promote. One view on service sector is that service sector would be an unlikely destination for the millions of low-skilled job, job seekers. India needs to focus manufacturing sector according to this view, uh, because manufacturing has backward linkages. But service sector is, our inequalities are there. We have very low productive service sector, very high, like IT and all. There are, there are wage inequalities. Uh, on the other hand, we have low productive, large informal sector getting very low income and wages. Another view is that some others view, you know, you know, manufacturing services are complementary. Uh, for example, Rupa Chanda study or uh, Barry Asian Green and Punam Gupta say that there is a complementary relationship between manufacturing and services. Even Niti Aayog says that we have to work on two legs, manufacturing and services. So, in fact, uh, you can't say that one sector is important. All the sectors are important, but a balanced view is needed. In fact, uh, for example, agriculture sector, higher incomes are important for poverty reduction and higher overall growth of the economy. Uh, now I come to the challenges of employment. I won't ex expand this because uh, it, these are all well known uh, because generating quantity and quality of employment, decline of women in employment, structural change already we discussed and youth unemployment is another uh, problem, labor market inequalities and high informal sector and migrant labor problems, uh, MSMEs uh, issues, and technology automation, skill development, and uh, of course, employment decline in during. Uh, so these are the some of the things which I won't elaborate uh, here. But one good thing is happening is that the rural non-farm sector share is increasing. Uh, you know, it rose from 26% uh, to 45% in 17, 18. For females also, it increased. Uh, so construction, transport, and communications have benefited. Uh, they are, it also benefited uh, SC uh, uh, schedule costs in uh, giving upward mobility. Uh, there is also increased connectivity in rural areas, uh, and we have public employment pro programs and education uh, remittances. Uh, and growth in rural non-farm has linkages with agriculture prosperity and also urban growth because some are agricultural uh, linkages, some urban linkages are there. Uh, in fact, you can see the non-farm uh, from 19% to 45% for males and about 12% to 27% for females. The, so there is some uh, good news about the rural non-farm sector. Uh, in fact, uh, there is uh, uh, you know, transformation across states, 2017, if you see Kerala, share of agriculture in total workers, both rural and urban, <coughs> is about uh, only less than 20 percent. In Punjab also, it's less than 30 percent, Haryana, Tamil Nadu. But on the other hand, uh, of course, Gujarat, about 43 percent. And uh, in UP, Rajasthan, MP, MP Raj, Chhattisgarh particularly, it's more than 60 percent. Uh, you know, on structural transformation, uh, in the literature, we have, you know, Solo, Kuznets, and Louis, uh, processes in structural transformation. Uh, there's a paper by Bosale uh, who talks about this structural transformation. So the Kuznets uh, structural transformation employment has been slow, uh, particularly the share of services in employment is much lower than share of service in GDP. And uh, Arthur Lewis process, it gives a mixed picture share of regular wage workers increased, but share of, uh, you know, unorganized sector is still very high. And also we have low women work participation rates. Now I come to the poverty. Uh, you know, the Dr. Alak talked about this, uh, uh, you know, the evolution of measurement. The planning commission was the nodal agency. Uh, since 1962, there have been several expert groups on measuring poverty. Uh, 1962 working group, and we have YK, uh, Dr. Y.K. Alex task force 1979, and 1993 Lakdawala committee, 
and 2009 Tendulkar Committee and Rangarajan Committee on 2014. Alak task force, of course, the you know NSS distribution of private consumption were adjusted pro rata to national accounts, and they have used All India Poverty Lines. Uh, but the Laknawala Committee report, they did not redefine the poverty line. It retained the uh, one defined by the Alak task force with the uh, 1973-74 All India basket. And they disaggregated uh, two states. Uh, the interstate price differentials were measured. So main departures of Lagdawala group over ALAC task force, one is state-specific poverty lines were used. And also it uses only NSS data without adjusting with national accounts consumption data. And Tendulkar group did not construct a poverty line. It adopted the officially measured urban poverty line of 2004-05 based on expert group. And then Rangarajan committee uh, expert group uh, had both uh, rural urban baskets separately. Uh, in fact, their estimates are much higher than the Tendulkar uh, uh, methodology. The rural poverty in 2011-12, uh, these are the numbers. Uh, there can be three explanations why you know there are uh, urban poverty is higher in uh, Rangarajan committee. 50% of the states have high urban poverty than rural poverty. So unlike Tendulkar group, Lagdawala and Rangarajan groups use two baskets separately for rural and urban. Uh, Tendulkar fixed urban poverty uh, line without uh, having uh, you know two baskets. So by definition, rural poverty was higher under Tendulkar. Rangarajan group, you know, they have used uh, higher things for urban poverty line. Uh, they use the clothing expenses, rent conveyance, and education ex expenses, which are higher for urban. So that is why that's why urban poverty is higher, and of course migration to urban areas. Uh, if you see trends in poverty, uh, you know during 93-94 to 2004-5, there was only 0.74 reduction per annum, whereas 2004-5 to 2011-12, uh, the reduction is 2.18. Significant reduction to, during 2004-5 to 2011-12. So yeah, this is the numbers. Uh, almost 137 million between 2004-5 and 2011-12 uh, decline. Uh, even the multi-dimensional poverty also shows that decline in almost 271 billion between 2005-6 and 2015-16. They have used this using NFHS surveys, uh, multi-dimensional poverty. The leaked data, of course, shows poverty increase during, uh, you know, for 2017-18. Uh, in fact, on well-being, uh, Professor Radhakrishna used poverty ratios and child malnutrition indicators. I will come back to that uh, uh, shortly. Uh, recent et estimates, you know, two working papers you, have, you must have seen in media, one from the IMF and the other from the World Bank, uh, have come up with estimates of poverty using international poverty lines. So both papers use, uh, you know, heroic assumptions in estimating poverty ratio in the post 2011-12 period, due to because unofficial uh, official data is not available. Bala et al. use national accounts data for updating poverty estimates, while World Bank uses CMI data. So according to Sujit Bala et al. paper, poverty declined from 32% in 2004 to less than 1% in 2020 including food transfers. Whereas World Bank, uh, it shows poverty is around 10%. So there is a need for collecting data on uh, consumer expenditure officially, uh, but you know also it should reduce the difference between NAS and uh, NSS private consumption. So these are the estimates you must have seen uh, uh, the Sujit Bala. So without food subsidy transfer, uh, about 33%, it's declined to 2.5% in 2020. With food subsidy transfer, this is a poverty line of $1.9 PPP, 32% uh, to less than 1%. And this is for PPP 3.2 poverty line. This is higher, uh, you know, still 26.5% in 2020. And with food transfers, about 18%. So I was talking about this uh, NSS data on consumption. So the private consumer expenditure of NSS as percentage of national account statistics, it was 94%. So in 
so that is the consumer expenditure of nss as percentage of national accounts consumer expenditure it was 95% in 70 to 73 but it gradually declined in fact uh, you know 2011 12 mmrp it is 47% and uh, 32% in recent uh, leaked data so this uh, uh, you know national statistical commission and uh, uh, they have to address this why is so much difference between two consumption uh, estimates on inequality you know uh, we can't discuss development without talking about inequality uh, you know all people talk to classical neo classical uh, moral philosophers all discuss about inequality recently of course kuznets uh, atkinson sen they talked about in the last decade of course piketty stiglitz uh, atkinson several others talk there is a book also called uh, after piketty uh, recently 2017 so two main arguments for reduction in inequality are it's important for its own sake and also it is for sustainability of growth uh, demand factor so growth and inequality relationship there is a huge literature uh, it's also important for reduction in poverty in fact trends uh, high income and wealth in inequality because consumption inequality is uh, slightly around 0.35 or so but income inequality is uh, much higher 0.5 and all uh, and wealth inequality is 0.7 or so point, between 0.6 and 0.7 and uh, there is increase in wealth inequality between 2004 5 and uh, also income inequality uh, again balla's paper shows that inequalities have uh, you know have been a constant or so 31.4 to 32.4 it says gini coefficient declined with food, food transfers in 2020 31 to 30 30% but other data shows inequality has been rising whether you take consumption income or wealth a recent all india debt investment survey also shows uh, increasing inequalities in wealth and even cmi data uh, showed that uh, some increase in inequalities uh, because the bottom decile composed of small and marginal farmers and laborers belong to scsts so their share has uh, not improved now also in the recent pandemic we heard of the k shaped impact on indian economy inequalities were increasing earlier but the pandemic has widened further for example the big companies and larger part of the corporate sector could manage the pandemic but we had uh, you know uh, informal sec- uh, sector workers migrants msmes have suffered a lot still continuing uh, then uh, so these uh, inequalities are rising and poverty still uh, official uh, estimates have not come so after poverty inequality i will say two uh, few indicators are nutrition for example under nutrition there is a decline uh, you know stunted stunting for example if you see nfhs 4 and 5 uh, nfhs 3 4 5 there is a decline in stunting and wasting of course not much decline and underweight also decline but there are a lot of regional disparities uh, if you see you know the red ones there is a uh, either not uh, decline or slight increase for example andhra pradesh assam even gujarat uh, you can see slight increase himachal pradesh uh, and kerala also there is a increase but uh, one good thing is the uh, Uh, poorer states like bihar chatisgarh haryana and then uh, of course haryana uh, jharkhand there is a decline in uh, in in uh, stunting and wasting of course some uh, increase is there in bihar uh, decline in chatisgarh and all and even maharashtra telangana and west bengal also there is a increase uh, but odisha punjab rajasthan tamil nadu there is a decline up and uttar uttarakhand so there is significant uh, regional disparities in uh, decline in uh, uh, under nutrition now i come to the last 10 10 minutes or so on uh, uh, social sector and other uh, things uh, there are six issues in social sector in general and health and education in particular uh, because there is low levels of human development indicators compared to other countries slow progress significant regional social and gender disparities slow growth in public expenditure and also 
delivery systems are uh, poor in uh, many places and also public and private sector issues. So both rise in public expenditure and improvement in delivery systems are needed. In fact, I quote every time when I talked about social sector, uh, the Deputy Prime Minister of Singapore uh, cautioned about school education in India. So he says, I quote, uh, schools are the biggest crisis in India today and have been for a long time. And uh, schools are the biggest gap between India and East Asia. And it is a crisis that cannot be justified, I uh, end quote. Uh, so equity in quality education is the key for raising uh, human development and reduction in inequalities. So a lack of focus can exclude uh, the disadvantaged sections uh, on if there is no quality education. And also dichotomy in health and education has to be fixed uh, because COVID-19 has given us several lessons on health sectors because apart from spending on uh, COVID-19, we have to move towards universal health care and spend to two to three percent on of GDP on health. But great uh, quality dichotomy exists in both of these sectors. For example, we have islands of excellence like IITs, IIMs and all. But on the other hand, we have uh, you know, vast majority of them uh, with poor learning achievements. Uh, we also have the experience of digital gap uh, in the during the pandemic. So one has to fix this dichotomy in uh, health and education. Uh, in fact, some data shows access to computer and internet. Uh, you can see the dichotomy, you know, SCSTs, OBCs compared to uh, other costs. One of the studies uh, at IGADR done, uh, you know, female representation and improving school learning. Uh, the findings, uh, they used administrative data of schools in India. They construct a large panel comprising of more than 6 million observations. And they show that using fixed effects methodology, increased female representation in school management committees is associated with improvement in school quality. So the results show that uh, school quality in terms of learning outcomes for children, particularly for girls, has improved. This is an important finding. On social protection, India has long experience in these programs like MG Narega, National Rural Livelihoods. Uh, uh, but, but there are some gaps in social protection programs, which uh, John Reyes and others talked about. Some of the poor are excluded due to other enabled services. This problem has been talked with. There's a, a lot of uh, discussion on universal basic income. Uh, but there is a, some consensus, you know, cash transfers, farmers, women, old age uh, population, a kind of quasi uh, UBI. In fact, Dr. Rangarajan and myself suggested uh, three proposals to meet the object of providing minimum basic income. So we suggested give cash transfer to all women in both rural and urban areas. And second, expand the number of days uh, under uh, uh, MG Narega and launch national employment guarantee scheme in urban areas, including skill, skill improvement. Uh, now I come to the last part, the sustainable future and climate change. Uh, you know, in the recent COP26, you might have seen, uh, India said by 2070, we want to achieve net zero emission, but China wants to achieve by 2060 and uh, US and EU, EU by 2050. And Prime Minister also announced uh, we'll have 50% uh, of its consumed energy from renewable sources by 2030. But India wants commitments of developed countries on providing finance, transfer of technology and emission reductions, which are uh, fair uh, demands from India because of the historically high consumption patterns of, patterns of the advanced countries. So the elephant in the room is the sustainability. You know, the, one of the important goals of agriculture development is sustainability. In fact, MS Swaminathan, Dr. M.S. Swaminathan appealed to the farmers uh, as early as 1968, when the Green Revolution started, uh, not to harm the long-term production potential <coughs> for short-term gain. In fact, Dr. Alag, of course, uh, you know, this agroclimatic regional planning is also a similar uh, thing, more on, you know, how to have efficient uh, uh, sustainability and efficiency. So, but we have to provide farmers with a policy on environment that will make agriculture growth more uh, sustainable. So on climate change, of course, we have to have resilience policies 
a shift in cropping patterns uh, there are but there are two types of inequalities regarding consumption patterns and impact on climate change it has implications for inequality first one is inequality in consumption patterns between advanced countries and developing countries uh, this is a historical responsibility developed countries carbon emissions were higher second one is inequality in consumption patterns between rich and poor in india because consumption of the rich in india is more or less equal to the rich of the advanced countries so they have the responsibility more to reduce the consumption patterns now i come to the monetary and fiscal uh, on a, a two or three slides and then i conclude uh, the macro policies such as trade fiscal and monetary policies for raising growth and equity but are we too conservative in monetary and fiscal policies because uh, there are two approaches in uh, monetary and fiscal one is supply side approach uh, basically you know this milton friedman kind of monetarist view second one is demand side approach more keynesian kind of thing output aggregate demand are important but demand need not be inflationary similar to other parts of the world india also followed accommodative monetary policy to support growth uh, in the last few years uh, both conventional and unconventional monetary policies uh, now of course the policy has to focus on inflation as it hurt, hurts the poor and middle class but on fiscal are we uh, following conservative approach because on fiscal policy taxes expenditures and subsidies are the major instruments uh, tax to gdp ratio has to be raised with a wider tax base uh, in fact recent uh, rbi report shows the multipliers uh, so suppose you spend 1 rupee uh, uh, expenditure uh, the multiplier is uh, about 0.72 total expenditure revenue expenditure 0.79 but on capital expenditure multiplier is very high so that way you know capital expenditure is important uh in fact uh, the on multipliers the rbi study shows during a period of economic slack fiscal stimulus should be there and capital expenditure is particularly effective but during the economic expansion multiplier values turn negative because if you keep on expanding the fiscal when there is a high growth and all that multipliers will not be there so during economic slack we should have more uh, fiscal uh, spending uh, but fiscal instruments like public investment in physical and social infrastructure can be used to increase growth and equity in the last two budgets government has focused but here is a catch there should be a balance between capital and revenue expenditure because you just can't spend only on capital because most of the expenditure on health and education are in revenue account so we can't say just i'll spend only on capital and neglect uh, you know health and education and state government finances have to be strengthened as they also spend on most of the sectors with uh, inclusive growth now i come to the conclusion uh, last two three slides the so we discussed the issues and policies for achieving higher growth and inclusion uh, growth was declining even in the pre pandemic period uh it was it came to 3.7% in 2019 20 the levels show a lot of loss of output during the pandemic period as i mentioned it will take uh, you know about t- uh, 10 years to overcome the covid 19 pandemic lo- losses and growth and equity policy should be followed simultaneously rather than you know somebody said that we first get the growth and then equity next uh so add on approach not solution so increasing quantity and quality of employment is a major challenge uh, for the country and rising incomes for agriculture and balanced approach between uh, you know service and manufacturing is important because it's not that you develop one sector and neglect the other sector within the sector where it is important one has to do and the great dichotomy has to be bridged for uh, you know health and education including uh, universal health care and this is becoming an important now because earlier we are talking about growth inclusion but sustainability also is becoming more important than before uh the last slide on monetary and fiscal policies have to support in achieving inclusive growth but in a federal country like india it is important to have larger role for states in achieving these goals because you know the expenditures are more uh, 
you know spent by states than the center and similarly the uh, local councils like panchayats and urban councils have to be empowered lastly you know achieving higher growth is important but growth without inclusion and uh, sustainability will not be useful for the future of india's development thank you very much thank you so much uh, professor mahendra dev i think it was a very expansive lecture you have talked you have covered a wide range of issues you have talked about the growth trend trends the inequalities opportunities investments the financial sector trade sector so you literally did a diagnostic study of all the the entire economy as well as the uh, major sectors uh, that the india uh, indian economy is currently facing and you have also covered uh, what could be the remedial measures in the agriculture sector especially since it employs the largest segment of the workforce in the country you talked about diversified agriculture high value agriculture food systems how should we increase the women's involvement then you've disaggregated the farmers income uh, and where the household income is coming from and where is the road ahead for more uh, balance and inclusionary growth you've talked about the small holder policies uh, organizing them into fpos you've talked about something which is very very topical that is a hidden hunger how we can counter uh, the malnutrition issues through safe and healthy diets for sustainable by promoting sustainable food systems you've talked about climate resilience cropping patterns the industry and manufacture and very rightfully you have mentioned that that we have to have a balance of manufacturing and as well as the service sector growth because our sim for the simple reason that our labor force is not skilled enough to be engaged in uh, the high value service sector jobs and uh, you've talked about the rural non farm sector and the, what is the link between the non farm sector as well as urbanization and urban growth you have brought out in a very lucid fashion and agriculture we the, this for the any student of uh, development economics we have been we have studied it uh, have you seen how agricultural prosperity and uh, you know despair in um, uh, of the farmers both lead to migration and have led to uh, urbanization and in our country i think if there is a mixed pattern that is happening whereas there are pockets of you know uh, diversity and diversified agriculture which is causing to a lot of urban growth there are other cases where the um, contrary is happening lastly you have uh, very uh, lucidly laid down the entire poverty debate how the poverty over the years has been measured inequality trends you have focused on and last but not the least i think uh, it was really uh, very um, insightful your comments on uh, this digital gap which is there in the school education sector and especially the covid situation has brought that to the fore as to how our school education is suffering and the children how they are suffering from uh, digital gaps and you have rightly mentioned that uh, social protection is also suffering from exclusion problems so for any kind of uh, balanced and inclusive growth we have to have a sustainable uh, pattern of growth which takes care of our environment and so climate policies really become they come to the fore largely lastly you have defined what could be the response of the monetary and the fiscal policies in such a situation and how we can best tackle uh, these issues so that uh, we move forward in a manner that it, it is much more inclusive rather than just Uh, having the growth as usual so i think um, uh, this brief summary uh, will not do justice to what uh, exactly the kind of breadth you have covered so we are really grateful for that and uh, we would really love if you would share your slides with us yeah and sure. uh, i think now we still have time so with the permission of the chair uh, we can take up a, a few questions sir if you agree professor dev Yeah, yeah, it's fine. Yeah, so if anybody wants to uh, pose a question, can please raise the hand. Yes, can see have, uh, yes, thank you very much. I have sent a yeah. question on Pareto principle. Can you please introduce yourself also? Uh, I'm Dr. V K Gautam. Okay. And thank you. on a base yeah. at Ahmedabad now. Okay. I have mentioned that we used to talk about Pareto principle eighty twenty distribution of wealth. a lot of things are coming up in the paper it, it is not an 8020 it is a 991 balki 99% lies with the 1% people is it hold good or is it just a loose talk thank you should we collect a few and we could do that i think we can collect a few and then
Well, since nobody else is coming to the fore, I think yeah. you can maybe uh -huh. people can think of some more Hello. questions. Yes. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, you are, sir. Yeah, thank you very much. And it has been a great learning experience uh, from uh, Mahindra Dave, sir. And uh, I have done my PhD in inclusive economic growth at NITI Mumbai. Uh, so one of the biggest issues, sir, uh, which we encounter is how to measure the inclusive growth outcome when we want to compare region to region or the states. Is there any, uh, because the literature review says they are making composite index and all, but is, whether the composite index is the best way of measuring inclusive growth or is there any other measurement way? And my second question, sir, is whether GST has helped in converting or transforming the, uh, particularly the unorganized sector into organized sector. What is the role of GST in the inclusive growth? Whether it helped us? Thank you, sir. <clears throat> yeah, uh, so the, on the first question, uh, you know, this uh, lot of Oxfam and other uh, reports have shown a lot of inequalities uh, increase uh, the 1%, uh, I don't know about 90%, but 1%, at least 50% of the assets and the uh, top 10% uh, having 90% something like that. Um, and so this, uh, although Surjit Balla and others say that there is inequality decline, but some, many other uh, studies which I agree that there seems to be, uh, I mean, increase in inequalities, uh, particularly during pandemic, uh, you can see that the corporate sector, they managed very well uh, and the stock market also did uh, very well. And then whereas uh, the daily wage laborers and others uh, in formal sector, MSMEs, they were not uh, done well. So I think uh, it is a problem uh, whether you, you have numbers 50% uh, or 90% uh, uh, that matters, but uh, but there are large, huge inequalities uh, in India as well as the globally. So, and the second uh, one is the on inclusive growth. The composite index uh, has its own problems. But in my book on inclusive growth, uh, I have uh, examined uh, you know four, uh, three, four things. The one is the agriculture as one of the inclusive sector-wise kind of thing. Uh, the agriculture, social sector, and then, um, you know, poverty elevation measures, employment. So these are the inclusive uh, kind of uh, uh, growth sectors. And uh, whereas, uh, I mean, uh, corporate, uh, very high tech or those things can be, uh, you know, not, not inclusive uh, kind of thing. So, uh, so that way one can analyze, but index also one can compute, but uh, it's a complicated uh, one. On the GST, uh, GST, it has, I mean, it's a good uh, reform. Uh, it started well, even during UPA government, it, they started. But uh, the problem is the, you know, MSMEs and all, uh, they fa faced problems in particularly in GST and all. Uh, earlier, they were not paying, but, uh, and also even, uh, you know, how to pay GST also many, many people faced uh, problem. So the reforms may be correct, but the helping the people is important, particularly MSME sector and uh, the informal sector. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Yeah. I, I, I would uh, totally wait for somebody else to say. Yeah. I would like to pose uh, just a supplement to your discussion on the manufacturing and versus and, and the service sectors. The Indian government is also, especially the Niti Aayog is of the view that we cannot really ignore the manufacturing sector. The service and manufacturing have to go together. But uh, I would just like your view whether the policy response currently towards the development of the small and uh, micro enterprises and how we can actually uh, divert the excess uh, agricultural surplus labor army into those sectors is enough, at, uh, especially in the post COVID scenario. Yeah. So on manufacturing services, uh... You know, uh, as I mentioned, uh, for example, Dr. Raghuram Rajan says that uh, we can't depend on manufacturing like Chinese model. So we have to focus on services uh, much more uh, than manufacturing. Uh, so it is a, I think we, as Niti Yog mentioned, we have to walk on two legs. The both uh, manufacturing, wherever the opportunities are there, 
one can develop, but we can't rely only on manufacturing. Services uh, also important. On uh, MSMEs, uh, uh, you know the recently. Hello. Uh, Hello. Bol heni. Yeah. Can you please, uh, everybody else, mute yourself? Yeah. So the uh, during the pandemic, of course, they have done a good, uh, you know, ECLGS uh, and some of the programs for credit and all. But the one thing they neglected is that uh, even before they're having ECLGS, some of the MSMEs already uh, uh, were dead uh, even during COVID uh, time. So for them, uh, you know, not much has been done uh, because how to revive them and all, uh, because those are existing, uh, it, it tries to help, but already many were, many were uh, you know, not working and all so that needs uh, more help and also you know msme sector almost uh, 40 percent of the employment they create so that is the crucial sector for uh, you know absorption of agriculture uh, workers uh, in uh, future so there is a need for uh, you know a lewis process uh, over time uh, otherwise the uh, you know you can't have low productivity uh, on the other hand within agriculture you can have more diversification, more incomes, uh, because you can't wait for non-agriculture non, uh, to absorb the thing. So it's a kind of medium uh, versus uh, long-term process. I think Manbanjan want to ask question. Yes. Any, any further questions from the audience? Uh, I am not sure whether uh, Professor Alak would like to make some conclusion remarks. So. Uh, I want to say something. Yes, please. Go ahead, Ansa. Yeah. Uh, actually, sir, uh, you have touched uh, the aspects from the demand side and the supply side. And uh, the problem is uh, from both the sides. I will just take the example of uh, digitalization that uh, during the past decade, a lot of digitalization have taken place. And now the rural areas have also got connected. But uh, what uh, we observe is that the returns to technology are not efficient. Because a lot of problems are there, you must you have discussed the social hierarchies and many things, and because of that, many people are not able to become the part of the development process. So, what do you suggest? Uh, as you have done a lot of work in this area, so what do you suggest that uh, how to solve these problems related to social hierarchy? Because these are very um, we can say these are the problems which are very hard to penetrate. Though digital technologies there, which is uh, we can say which uh, we can contribute to inclusion as compared to other types of efforts that have been taken, but uh, still we are not able to get the returns. So, how do you look at uh, uh, the problem from the side of social hierarchy? I mean, the uh, digital, uh, you know, particularly rural areas, uh, penetration is still low. The, because uh, if you read uh, John Dre's articles, particularly, you know, the problems they faced when they introduced uh, digital. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, they, uh, the Sabjit Benerji and all, they did uh, even the randomized experiments on that. Uh, said that, you know, digitization helps and all. But what uh, John Dre's one of the articles says is that, uh, for example, MG Narega, when they introduced uh, these digital things, uh, the waste payments delay is much more. Uh, in fact, 30 days more it took to pay wages because uh, they have to send to central government for, you know, to get the money, panchayats and others. So it took more time and all. So one has to uh, do gradually this digitization, particularly in this social protection programs, and also to the disadvantaged sections, uh, maybe directly we have to uh, deal with them till we, uh, you know, bridge this gap. Because uh, directly we introduced and uh, then, uh, you know, many people are left out, then uh, that will be a, a problem for implementation. So uh, I think uh, we have to have, uh, you know, 
for example uh, rural areas good bandwidth for uh, the internet and other things and uh, also educate them uh, in how to uh, have the technology so it's not a short term kind of thing uh, it has to be gradually done they I mean the skill development particularly you know on technology because even the urban areas educated also find difficult some of the technology things so uh, rural areas you need much more uh, education to have it education and investment uh, to have it thank you sir uh, there is a question in the chat box by uh, dr fernandes uh, shall i read it yeah, yeah please. please okay considering that economic issues are not of too much concern to the present political dispensation how likely are the various policies that you have suggested going to be implemented I mean they you know various governments have their own uh, uh, you know uh, approaches the for example uh, uh, the earlier upa government says rights approach for for example if you take social protection programs whereas this government has a programmatic approach i mean for example lpg gas or uh, you know sanitation and those kind of things it's not rights based kind of thing but so both have i mean these these uh, uh, also some of them sanitation and all helped uh, the thing and also some cash transfers uh, they have introduced per pm kisan and uh, so so different approaches uh, uh, so one can um, i mean question i mean both the governments uh, you know why they have not succeeded in uh, reducing poverty and inequality and all so the they have ad advantages and disadvantages in uh, you know government approaches and also state governments uh, different state governments have uh, the performance is uh, varies uh, you know at a point of time and over time I think uh... we should uh, now not take much of your time and yeah. i would like to again thank you so much uh, professor dev for uh, uh, this very illuminating and very informative and very rich uh, kind of presentation that you have made and um, uh, i think uh, we will all agree that the, the approach towards balanced and inclusive growth has to be multi pronged and we cannot really say that what could be one solution and one uh, overnight it can be handled so i think you have laid down a very uh, in a very rich manner citing from the current extant literature that what could be the different ways that we can approach the problems that are encountered in each sector of the economy as well as the different sections of people so to that extent i think uh, this was a very informative lecture and i'm really grateful and on behalf of spicer i would really like to wish you uh, uh i mean thanks a lot for uh, this very great lecture uh, i think uh, since we we may uh, now conclude the session but before doing that i would request uh, professor hansa jain to propose a formal vote of thanks before we uh, disperse thank you so much mm -hmm. and thank you I, uh, just one more comment i i would also request professor dev to be part of our activities in future i think the fault lies with us in not really approaching you and i have realized that you are very approachable and i would definitely we would like to involve you in future in regard in our training activities as well as our seminars yeah sure I really look forward to your increased involvement in the spicers activities uh, thank you professor mehta uh, i respect the chairperson professor bhai ke alag professor mahendra dev director and vice chancellor indira gandhi institute development research mumbai professor neeti mehta and distinguished guests and students uh being the convener of the program it is my privilege to propose vote of thanks uh, on the occasion i on behalf of spicer and on my own behalf extend my heartfelt thanks to professor mahendra dev for taking his precious time and consenting to deliver the lecture in the memory of professor lakdawala on the contemporary issues of indian economy that is policies on economic growth and inclusion your lecture has been a fitting tribute to this stalwart who had contributed a lot to indian economy you have highlighted many important issues ranging from global to local and remarked that along with looking at the economy from macro perspective for achieving higher growth there is a need to address the rising inequalities across regions income groups social groups gender and rural urban from the local level approach also for inclusion and sustainability 
Uh, you have enlightened us through your thought-provoking ideas in this direction. Thank you very much, sir, for uh, a stimulating address in the form of uh, this lecture. I also express my sincere thanks to Professor Alak for sharing the program and uh, adding value by insightful remarks. We are grateful for your unstinted support and uh, encouragement. Vote of thanks to all the dignitaries, dignitaries, particularly the eminent professors and other academicians from different universities, colleges, and institutions for making it convenient to attend the program and grace the occasion for, from their presence. I also want to thank the students from different universities and colleges for their active participation. Uh, actually, this uh, time it was through virtual board, so we were able to get participants from all over India. Uh, but uh, there is a problem through virtual mode that I'm sorry to say that I'm, I was not able to recognize all, but I must appreciate their uh, participation. My thanks are also due to my colleagues and staff members who have supported me uh, in organizing the event. And uh, I once again thank everyone for uh, making this program successful and uh, Professor Dave, and we want to have this type of opportunity in future also. And the next time we will uh, invite you uh, through offline mode at our institute. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much for inviting me. It was a pleasure, sir.